I'm thrilled to introduce the Atlas Project, uh, Calgary's Art Underground with Jim Ellis, Diana Sherlock, Mark Dicey, Le Leslie Sweeter, and Janet Turner. The last three are, of course, the Drunken Paw Collective. And uh, I'm going to introduce Jim and ask Jim to introduce the speakers and then let you, uh, let you go ahead. Um, again, Thank you, Jim, for, uh, for being here today and helping to organize this program. He is a professor of English at the University of Calgary and the director of the Calgary Institute for the Humanities. Um, the uh, CIH is, uh, sorry, the Atlas Project, which he's going to speak about today, uh, is a project that documents alternative overlooked or lesser known histories of Calgary. For over 40 years, CIH has acted as a bridge between the university and the community, promoting values of humanistic inquiry and civic conversation. CIH is Canada's oldest humanities institute. Today, Ellis and a cast of esteemed Calgary artists and writers will discuss Calgary's Art Underground, a remarkable publication that chronicles Calgary's vibrant art community. Thank you all for joining us today, and I'm so looking forward to uh, to your presentation. Um, well, thanks very much, Michelle, for the invitation to talk today and to Marla Halstead for facilitating. I'm very happy to be here uh, today with the creators of this wonderful map. Um, before we engage in our conversation with them, I wanted to give some background and some context um, to this particular map, oops, which is flying ahead of me here. Um, so uh, the map is part of a series of maps that collectively are known as the Calgary Atlas Project. Uh, and as Michelle said, it, it aims to document lesser known histories of the city. Ultimately, we're aiming for about 18 uh, to 20 maps. Um, the project is housed uh, at the Calgary Institute for the Humanities. There are about five professors uh, working together. And uh, the project is part of the Institute's ongoing mission, in a sense, to provide a bridge between the university and the community, sometimes in the form of community-engaged research, which is what we consider these maps to be, um, sometimes in, in terms of talks. And I do want to put in a plug, first of all, for our fourth annual Pride Lecture, which is going to be coming up in Pride Week. But in two weeks, we're going to be having a lecture at the Calgary Central Library, April the 8th. It's our first applied ethics lecturer Kwame Anthony Appiah, the New York Times ethicist, will be talking about the place of identity in politics and ethics. So do join us uh, Friday, April the 8th for that. Um, so the Calgary Atlas Project uh, uh, started about four or five years ago. Um, and the aim, as we've said, is to document these overlooked histories. Typically what we do is talk to a local historian of some kind to get them to tell an underrepresented history in by first identifying 30 to 40 sites. Um, once that process is underway, uh, we get a local artist or an artist collective uh, to interpret that history uh, in map form. Now, the map that shows up isn't necessarily going to allow you to navigate the city. Um, what it does, in a sense, is to interpret that history geographically, to project the story onto the space of the city, and to get us to understand and see the space of the city differently. And if possible, we always try to get both writers and artists who are actually connected to that history, um, which I think um, helps them to and us uh, to illuminate that history um, in new and surprising ways. So the project started uh, with our queer map. Um, it drew on the talents of Kevin Allen, who, as you may know, is the lead of the uh, of Calgary's Gay History Project. Um, and he identified about 30 sites in the city, which were important to the city's queer history, including a number at the University of Calgary, which made me uh, quite proud. Um, we then handed those sites over to Mark Clintberg, who uh, a queer artist at the Alberta University of the Arts who then interpreted that history for us. Um, the map you produce is a bit queer itself, as the label says, you can't orient it properly. Um, it's not to scale, you could never use it to get around the city. Uh, what it does offer, however, is a new way of looking at the city. Um, an interesting aspect of the project that we didn't necessarily anticipate 
is how the maps would be taken up by others. Um, so for example, the first, the queer map um, was taken up by a young voguing group um, at this year's Fluid Fest in October. Um, this group of young voguers decided to use the map. They identified 15 sites on the map. They did performances at those 15 sites, videotaped them, uploaded them to a digital version of the map so that you could then click on the site, get the history of that site and its significance to the city, and then also see this wonderful um, uh, voguing performance. The second map, uh, First Nations Stampede, um, this map documents the involvement from the beginning of local First Nations uh, with um, the Calgary Stampede. We were extremely fortunate uh, in this uh, to have the artist Adrian Stimson uh, involved in it. Uh, when he started, he, Adrian's got a long association with the Stampede. He used to go there uh, as a child from Siksika. And then as, a, as an adult, an artist, he um, uh, did performance art around the, the Stampede. He did uh, uh, an alternative Stampede parade uh, in his persona as, as Buffalo Boy. Um, so when he started to work on the map, he was just going to do watercolor on paper, but it, it, he said it resisted him and would it be okay to do it on a buffalo robe. Um, so he, we said, of course, uh, he produced this magnificent uh, work of art uh, that uses uh, the typical time spiral of an Indigenous story robe um, to tell the history of the stampede. Um, so that robe was displayed uh, this summer at the Glenbow, and it's now um, at the Ramai Modern in Saskatoon. Uh, the next map is, of course, our glorious uh, Calgary Art Underground, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, fourth map, uh, Calgary Goes to the Movies, uh, which documents both all the forgotten movie palaces in Calgary, of which there were many, and also a number of um, alternative uh, screening organizations. Um, one of the interesting things now about the maps is that things show up on, on two different maps. Uh, so Calgary Cinematheque, for example, or the fire we've become shows up on this map and also uh, the alternative art map. Amanda Forbes and Wendy Tilby uh, are themselves on the map as uh, the bleak midwinter film festival, um, but they're also I, um, local heroes in a way. Um, lesser known fact about them is they have been nominated for two Academy Awards, uh, probably more than anybody else uh, in Calgary, perhaps in Canada, who knows. Um, next, uh, Workers Stand Up, Calgary's Labour History, uh, done by local historian, labour historian Kirk Neergarth, uh, and illustrated by Karen Jean Mills, who's part of a group called the Graphic Labour Collective, who do zines and posters uh, to make Canada's labour history uh, more available. And finally, the last map to appear in print is Calgary's Architecture in 40 Buildings, uh, done by uh, text by Graham Livesey and image uh, by the local architecture firm um, Spectacle. So those are the maps we've produced so far. Um, upcoming, uh, we're going to have a history of Stampede Wrestling, um, a city of romance, the Calgary literary world in the 1920s, uh, text by Sean Hunter and the map by Evelyn Kline, an animal's guide to Calgary, uh, with Matt by Rita McCo, and finally, um, Calgary's energy history. Um, ultimately, as I've said, we're hoping um, to have about 40 maps. So if you're interested in getting the maps, I should say that they're available at various places throughout the city, Shelf Life Books, Next Page, Esker, and Owl's Nest. Um, and I think now they're available at the Nickel as well. Um, in, but also, I would say, uh, if you're interested in the maps, let us know, and especially if you know an organization uh, who would be interested in the maps. Uh, we do try to send them out to communities who are um, documented or involved. So we've sent maps to Siksika, uh, to the Stampede's uh, Indigenous Education Program. We sent the queer map to local uh, high school GSAs and Camp Firefly. Um, so do be in touch if you know of people um, who might be interested in receiving copies of these maps. It's important to us just to get them out into the world um, and to get people to understand the very rich diversity of this city and this city's history, to get people to understand Calgary differently. Okay, so now it's time to turn to the main event, 
Um, and I want to introduce the uh, researcher and writer of uh, the art map, uh, Diana Sherlock. Diana Sherlock is well known to everyone in Calgary's art community. Uh, she is an independent curator, writer, and educator. Um, since 1994, her projects have created many opportunities for contemporary artists here in the city and elsewhere uh, to produce art in specific locations, contexts, and cultures of display. Most recently, of course, you will have seen her show at the Nickel uh, that she curated, Mary Shannon Will, People, Places, and Things, which was a glorious exhibition, I think, uh, that documented, again, the history of one of Calgary's much uh, mourned treasures. Um, she's published over 80 texts in gallery, gallery catalogs, art journals internationally, and she is the, up, the editor of the uh, upcoming Larissa Fassler Watershed, um, which is forthcoming this summer, she says, from Distance Press in Berlin. Okay, so Diana, um, one, of the, one of the things about this map uh, is that they're often produced by people who have connections to them. Um, I even played a small role in, in some of the organizations on the art map. Can you talk about your connection to the history that you were researching and how that history might have shaped how you approach it? Yeah, thanks, Jim. And uh, thanks, Michelle, uh, and to the Nickel for having us today. Um, yeah, well, I think you and I may have even uh, overlap within the Artist Run Center community uh, a few times, uh, working at Truck and other places. <clears throat> um, in my history in the city really did start with Artist Run culture, and um, I, I met Mark very early on, uh, too, uh, through the new gallery and uh, his own work. And um, you know, I originally was involved with artist and culture in Vancouver. Uh, I think the first artist run center I ever went to was Grunt Gallery in Vancouver, and I met Glenn Altine when he was but a babe. And uh, and then when I came back to Calgary, um, I knew these places existed, um, even though they weren't uh, that easy to find. Uh, they weren't really in your regular gallery guides so much, and uh, you know that was in the late 80s, early 90s. So uh, we sort of had uh, the, the first wave uh, of established artist run centers. And then we started to get sort of like a second wave of uh, centers as well as uh, projects. So I think one, one way um, my experience really informed uh, the way I wrote the history or approached the research was I started uh, and uh, the people I knew and where I was grounded and the organizations that, that I had experience uh, with uh, over the last 20, 25 years, and, and then built out from that. So um, certainly uh, some of this history does exist um, in uh, larger publications and media has done a history. Uh, Stride has done a number of publications. Um, Truck as well did a 25th anniversary dialogue. The New Gallery has several uh, histories. Uh, the first 10, uh, Silver, the 25th anniversary. They're usually anniversary publications that kind of look back and and within those documents they also point to um, other organizations that, or projects that overlapped or maybe grew out of uh, the activities in these centers and I think that what that's something that's really interesting is that um, you know it's a it's a map um, uh, but it is a map that actually reflects very much a, a network of activities uh, driven by individuals in this city over the last, well, 100 years, actually, if you want to go back to uh, the very early activities in the, in the, the 20s, 1910s and 20s. So I'm interested in how the literary map uh, overlaps. Um, so uh, that network of people and organizations sort of uh, spawned uh, a lot of offshoots. And some of those projects are, you know, ongoing. Uh, so writing the history was, yes, it's it, uh, the 56 locations on this map um, document uh, past initiatives that have, um, you know, gone and also 
point to a continuity of um, existing initiatives that um, either were started in the past and have continued or have grown out of, of past initiatives. So, um, so I guess I just started with what I knew and then, and then I started to look for what I didn't know. And um, that really was a, a process of writing a lot of emails and uh, phoning a lot of people and looking for um, um, obscure documents and trying to track down um, names of people or organizations that were doing interesting things uh, in Calgary that maybe were, were less well known, less, um, less documented. So we've, we've gotten really good at documenting our histories in various ways uh, through media certainly since the you know, mid 90s, uh, you know, after the internet and where things we have more access to digital uh, mechanisms. But, you know, prior to that, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of um, handbills that were hand drawn or they were photocopied or they were, you know, posters that were stuck on a wall. And, uh, and a lot of things have occurred um, in our histories that just aren't documented or that documentation was destroyed. Uh, along the way by fire and flood and loss and theft and other things. So, um, so it was really a, um, a long process of just trying to um, collect a lot of information, look for a lot of unknowns. And then, and then I think probably the most challenging part of the whole process was the distillation of that. Um, so what you see on the, the map project is um, there are 56 uh, organizations uh, plus actually because some of some of those have uh, other organizations referenced within them. Um, <clears throat> but in fact, it's a much greater history than I could ever include in in you know, one sheet, one poster back. Uh, so in fact, we ended up, I ended up writing probably double, um, more than double of what you see here. Um, and I think we're trying to figure out what, what to do with some of that information as well uh, in the future so it can circulate. Uh, but we did have to put parameters around, uh, you know, what kind of content we could include on the map. So uh, you'll notice when you look at it that we've, we've really drawn the parameters around um, if they were major organizations, there, there are major organizations that have um, passed uh, into the past uh, or um, have spawned uh, if they're still existing, have spawned a number of smaller organizations. So they become a route and a way to sort of discuss uh, the projects and initiatives that grew out of them. Um, and then I think a lot of the, um, I would call them activities or projects that uh, are captured on the map are really individually driven. And they have happened and they have stopped and they've passed into history. Um, those artists, are more than likely still working in some way, either in Calgary or elsewhere. Uh, but the, the actual activity um, is over. And what's interesting to me, there's a couple of things, is how it's like clusters or groupings of, of artists or parts of the community that got together at certain time, times where there was a need or there was a lot of energy around a set of ideas. Uh, maybe there was uh, opportunity uh, in terms of space or access to, to um, uh, resources. Um, and then you see a whole you know, percolation of collaboration and a whole bunch of things sort of pop, 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 happen at the same time. So the map for me tries to capture that kind of ecology, uh, that kind of collaborative network. Um, and it also points to, uh, because it's a map and the locations were important uh, in terms of the Atlas project, um, it points to the fact that a lot of these organizations or projects were very itinerant. Um, they've been moved around uh, due to the economic boom and bust cycles in Calgary. Uh, they've been moved around sometimes because of um, uh, sort of relational changes. So they, they, part of their community moves to the, the Southwest um, and part of the community moves to, I don't know, the Southeast. And uh, you end up with these sort of splits and, and changes that changes the, the nature of what is produced as well. So I, I thought trying to 
note that some organizations say, you know, Clouds and Water, which is uh, now TNG, the new gallery, you know, over a course of 30, 40 years have moved like 10 times. Uh, and it shows the challenges, I think, of trying to maintain this kind of community and activity in our city uh, when the city is quite economically volatile and um, at least sometimes on the uh, seems to be uh, a little less supportive politically, perhaps, in a conservative environment of art, but how much still happens, like the sort of the resilience of the community uh, in those circumstances and how that really is, uh, I think, reflected in the collabor collaboration and the ecology. Yeah, that's one thing I think that your map displays beautifully is, is the kind of web <laughs> of all of these connections. Um, I will note that uh, uh, your your map identified more sites than any other map, um, and then within the within the descriptions even more. Um, but it really does display this sort of spider web um, effect uh, across time of these organizations. And my experience in the city is just how open the art community is um to new things to new collaborations and to different kinds of media as well i mean one thing that i like about your map is the way that it's it's not just the little galleries uh mm -hmm. it, it's events and happenings and it's not just fine art it's music um it's cinema and all sorts of other things did you uh you talked a little bit about the border lines the, the fences you put up um were there things that you just had to leave out that you were disappointed with or um, um your principle really there yeah I mean, I, mean I think this? I think um I I you know I had a tendency I went down that sort of rabbit hole uh a number of times and so a lot of the larger institutions that we would identify with and have probably a higher public pro profile uh are not included, like the histories of those institutions are not included on the map. Uh, they may get a mention, but they're not, they again are a root that the other things sort of spring from. So I focus on the other things. Um, so that's an aspect that's not here. I think it's very interesting. And I said this earlier on Peter's uh, CGSW show that um, I think it's very interesting in Calgary, how we've never had a, like one big art institution. Uh, and we were really the only major city in Canada that doesn't have that. And for a lot of people, that's been, you know, a real problem. But I also think that there's a real benefit to that. And we have a number of, you know, smaller to medium sized institutions in this city, like a lot of them, uh, like the Nickel. Like IG at ACAD, for example, that have done amazing work, um, and our artist run centers, who are, uh, you know, those centers now are very, very established. They are they're smaller, but they're still, I mean, they're professional institutions. They have long histories of 30, 40 years. Um, we have a ton of artist run centers, uh, presentation as well as production. Um, and I think we have that precisely because we didn't have the one big institution. Um, so the big institutions do what they do very, very well. And I think they, they allow uh, communities to have access to certain types of art and experiences that um, obviously the medium sized and smaller ones cannot. Uh, but it, the cost of that is often the cost of diversity. And um, I personally um, prefer the diversity. I prefer the sort of um, um, flexibility um, of the smaller and medium sized institutions to be able to change and be really responsive. So um, yeah, so they're not included. And the other thing that's not included here is, are the commercial galleries. And I really went down a rabbit hole with them and have written quite a bit about the commercial scene. And I'm really interested in actually doing an further work on that. Uh, it's a history that's not written uh, here uh, or actually in very many places uh, to any great degree. And of course the commercial galleries, even though they are commercial and they are there for profit, they're very, very much part of the ecology. They allow artists to, you know, uh, support themselves. They they work with other institutions to 
to um, raise the profile of art and artists. Uh, they, they do education, they do all sorts of things. So they're really important part of the ecology as well. And there's often, I think, and I think sometimes it's an arbitrary um, omission of the commercial sector because it's commercial only. So those two things are not really addressed on the map. And I'd like, I'd like very much to, to see that reflected elsewhere. Yeah. Well, actually, you anticipated my next question was going to be what what is distinctive about Calgary's art scene? But I think that you've given some really interesting insight into how precisely we are different, partly because of the absence of that big anchor gallery, perhaps. But we should probably bring in uh, the artists at this point, uh, who you gave an astonishing challenge to mm -hmm. <laughs> with your many many identified people and places and things. Uh, so perhaps I'll leave it to you to introduce uh, Drunken Paw. Yeah, so I, I, when Jim and I were trying to think of who could do this artwork and who could take on my labyrinthine um, uh, narrative, um, obviously it had to be artists who'd been deeply involved with the uh, artist run community in calgary and uh, janet and leslie and mark uh, have a long long history in calgary as uh, practicing artists individually and then as drunken paul collaboratively um, you've you've all been involved with a number of the initiatives that are on are on the map and probably some that aren't as well so um yeah i'm i was so thrilled when you you took it on um and and took it on and and succeeded so beautifully and the interpretation i think of the sort of chaos and network uh and the movement too uh of of all the people and places on the map so yeah i'd love to hear a bit more about your process and how you how you made decisions about what to what to render and how <laughs> thanks diana so mm -hmm. i guess maybe what i'll do is show our screen here share our screen uh so we can quickly explain all of that it's wonderful to be invited Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank Fantastic. Yeah, we can't thank you enough for, uh... oh. Because we've been working together for 13 years as a, as a collective, collaborative drawing project. And it was, uh, it just fit beautifully for us to, to, uh, to read the, the text Diana wrote and to springboard from there. Mm -hmm. However, we didn't have a clue how to begin. <laughs> <laughs> It, it was an overwhelming uh, uh, project. Uh, so we had to think about uh, what a map was, what maps have looked like historically um, in order, because there was so, uh, there was just so much information for us to wrap our heads around. And we usually work uh, very organically, um, responding to each other's mark making and rotating through uh, the images. So. We didn't know how to approach uh, something that had a very specific structure with, with very particular uh, requirements. requirements and points of information that had to find their way into this image that we were creating. Uh, so we did a lot of research and uh, Mark uh, came across this 17th century cosmic map uh, of multiple cultures of the, on the Indian continent and we we loved the the way that it. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, and, just just the layout yeah. of it, and and like made us question what is a map, and is it? It just as some of the other maps that Jim was mentioning, like is it used to walk down the street, or in this day and age, you're going to pull out your phone and and Google search or whatever to to get where you're going. But uh, so we we knew we needed a good strong uh, basis and architecture to work from. And to look at these ancient maps and others we found, it just, it, it made sense. It, it gave us a freedom that it, that it could be like a drunken paw drawing, uh, but we needed, we needed good, strong uh, architecture and, and to know that we needed to respect the, the text that was written and, you know, a history that we were very much involved with. And, but so much of it, we were finding out that we, we did not know as well. And we need, needed to research. 
Um, so after the cosmic map, here's a, just a quick pick of us. This is what our cosmic multiculture happenings kind of came, how that came together. But what we did was we, uh, Janet then found a, a, a 1924, uh, a map, uh, map of Calgary from 1924 in the University of Calgary archives, digital archives. And we decided to use that. Uh, we had that printed out on four sheets and uh, used that as our armature, I guess. Um, and we, we, we kind of stole the idea of the concentric circles from the cosmic map. And we placed three concentric, concentric circles over top of the map. And I'm gonna kind of zoom in there. Oh. Oops, now I'm going, I can't zoom in there, but um, we just did that in pencil and the two over, overlap, sort of overlaying that over top of the, the uh, historical map just suddenly gave us that, that really clear armature to work on and it gave us the freedom then to just respond, right? So. Um, so we use the confluence as as a, a center, starting point. as the center where right. everything emanated out of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we built a key, and we built a key to work from. So we had to start with uh, one map where we placed uh, all the locations um, on our uh, historic copy of the map. Um, we worked with Letraset. We we. Uh, actually, for our little dots on our maps, we uh, used a hole punch and glued them onto the map. <laughs> and so it would be nice if people could see these in person because they're actually quite textured. And uh, so four maps were made, and so the key was that this first one, which we'll show, and and then the other three, um, very much in the process that um, we, that Drunken Paw always works in. We always have three maps. And we always work together. Uh, we don't hand them off or anything. We work when we're present with each other in a room, in a situation, and we rotate through, through the maps. So one thing we know for sure is, is that the one map that was chosen would not have been made with the, without the other two or three, in the sense, including the key. So we always see, see it as one. Um, just like our collective, we see as one in the end, our, our collision of ideas and working processes as, as working towards an end result. So you can see here the density uh, that happens in the center of the map. So when you think about 56 uh, locations and events, uh, organizations and events, they're all, uh, it's all a very chaotic, active center and core there in the city. Um, and that was one of the big challenges we had was how do we possibly represent that with, with uh, text and images and, uh, you know, so what we did here, we have a few that sort of give you a sense of how things started, you know, how things began. Um, anybody else wanna jump in? Go ahead. Once we sort of had that, once we had that uh, architecture in place so that we could just start working with in our, in our standard kind of drunken paw sense, um, we just began, each of us stood in front of uh, one of the maps <laughs> and uh, just started responding to the map itself. And um, wrote that. so certainly the lay of the land, the rivers were so important for us to mm -hmm. uh, shapes and forms and that we could respond to. Mm -hmm. I think there was a great deal of tension between uh, Drunken Par's process. We really needed to um, be true to our process in the way that Drunken Paw works mm -hmm. uh, all the time, which is very chaotic. We don't, uh, we don't discuss uh, our work with each other. We converse about a lot of other things, but we're, we're not planning what we're doing yeah. on these images. So with each of us working on a separate image, uh, we are just responding to the marks made from the, from the previous, previous yeah. person. 
And we, we rotate constantly through these images. Um, so we, what we did in this situation uh, was we kept, as you can see in this image, we kept a list, three lists of all the locations that are on the map. Uh, each list uh, was for each drawing that we had. And then we had uh, Diana's uh, writing there and the maps given to us by uh, CIH. And, and what we had to do basically was when we placed a, um, one location or event onto or organization onto one of the drawings, we had to check it off on the list mm -hmm. so that everybody knew exactly where we were at and nobody was duplicating anything mm -hmm. on one drawing. Mm -hmm. So each of the drawings, really uh, grew into different monsters. And um, they, uh, you will have some on one image, you will have some organizations kind of coming forward in bigger, with bigger imagery and others going back. And then on another image, it'll be different organizations. So it, it really, uh, when you see all three together, it speaks to the, the movement of everything and and the sort of the vibration that's created by all of these uh, energies of different organizations and events that happened throughout time, right? So it certainly was the nature of the beast that one needed to be chosen, but uh, it will be really important eventually for uh, the public for an event where, where uh, all three maps could be seen that's as true. one. Yeah. Can I ask how you, how did you source your imagery? Um, I know not, it comes out of your head, a lot of it, but then there are definitely references to sort of visual, visual monikers of some of the organizations. So how did you, how did you source your Im imagery for the, for the maps? A lot of it was Google it and <laughs> look for, look for uh, icons and things ways in which those organizations had represented themselves and uh, try and uh, implement that in some way or suggest that in some way um, just for the organizations that we could find any mm -hmm. corresponding logos yeah. or yeah we worked sometimes sometimes with logos uh, sometimes we would uh, just steal an image off of somebody's website mm -hmm. you know, it became important for us that um, that the, the people who were represented on the map might be able to recognize themselves mm -hmm. in some of the imagery we were using. Uh, we also were drawing images from our, our memories of remembering what some what what a place was like or what a what, what a, it felt what like. an experience, you know, mm -hmm. little bits and pieces uh, from our our own experiences that stood mm -hmm. out and that we were able to grab a hold of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly it's been a wild ride these years. Mm. decades of uh, this underground history that's uh, that's been touched on here it's it's pretty amazing and and all of us having a different uh, a different relationship to that history mm -hmm. and and to have those conversations while we were working it was really important to bring mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I think that that was one of the most amazing things about doing the research too because I, I never would have been able to do this without the whole community uh, all the all the people that I wrote, all the people that um, uh, did phone interviews with me. Um, it was during COVID, so I couldn't go into places uh, to look through their archives or their files. Um, I couldn't access archives um, during COVID unless they were online. Uh, so I really had to rely on you know phoning you know somebody at the new gallery and saying, uh, "Could you look this up for me? Um, is there something that?" you know, corresponds with this because people's memories uh, are so different of a time, right? Your experiences of a place change yeah. your memories and then you get a lot of contradictions. <laughs> and of course you're trying to, even though it's not a comprehensive history and all histories have omissions and mistakes, you're trying to be as accurate as you, you mm -hmm. can be. And so you try to resolve those contradictions somehow. Uh, by talking to people and comparing it with your your own memories. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you you seem to have like a similar, you probably had a similar challenge as I did in terms of figuring out 
uh, like I was trying to figure out what to include and what to exclude, what to emphasize, what not to emphasize. So I can see that when I when I see the drawings, I can see your struggle with that in terms of the scale of imagery. And how, how did you resolve some of those challenges? Maybe a some lot of them, them were, again, just really, or it, they just happened organically. Yeah. Uh, because like once we had all of that uh, architecture in place, we didn't have a lot of in typical fashion, we didn't have a lot of conversation as to how to create it, you know, how to organize the images. They all just sort of happen um, organically as we mm -hmm. progress. Um, but yeah, massive struggle, uh, challenge. Organizations like the New Gallery, Clouds and Water, Second Story, <laughs> et cetera, Truck. Yeah, all those multiple locations, and and we wanted them all on there somehow mm -hmm. or another. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, not not only did um, I give you fifty six locations, but then I gave you locations within locations and <laughs> yes. ABCDs. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, there, <laughs> there had there was a certain point where we just had to accept the fact that you're you know you're not going to be able to read this as a map at all ever anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Although if you, if you dive in, you can still sometimes. Yeah, if you dive yeah. in, you can, see the, you can see the little numbers and you can get a sense yeah. of, you know, if this is the center of the city, then things are moving out yeah. this way. And, and it's yeah. everything is in relation to everything else. So yeah. it does. So a, a great thing Leslie said earlier is that, that the orientation of these, these were spun as they were drawn through the six months we worked on these. Mm -hmm. um, so every direction is the way they were worked. And then we make the final, as, as with all our drawings, we make the final decision on orientation. It's a group decision. Mm -hmm. And then we mark all of that on the back, any information and an orientation arrow. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And you can see uh, in these slides of the finished, we wanted to show you the, uh, the margins on the page, right? So um, you can see all the notes uh, that we, we had in the margins and check marks and and those were all happening particularly towards the end when we were you know having to go through them and make sure nobody was missing and make mm -hmm. sure that everybody had uh, representation uh, th that visual representation on the map um, just because we weren't you know we didn't take a while we were drawing you know, we didn't have a very orderly way to, of going about it because we did not, again, we did not want to sabotage our own process. Uh, um, so it, it had to still be a drunken paw, even though we were having to uh, work within certain parameters, right? So, so that's where uh, all the notes and check marks and the lists to make sure we're, we're all on, on board and, and on the same page with where everything is at. But uh, yeah. So one we were, the, sorry. Uh, I was going to say that the, one of the problems that you handed uh, the Atlas Committee was uh, you gave us three drawings. And we, <laughs> had pick, we had to pick one. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you because you, you made a really interesting point earlier that, um, you know, it, it is three drawings. Um, in a sense, it's one story, but in a sense, it's the, the three maps are three stories. Mm -hmm. um in the way they pull things forward or push things back a little bit is that the, what i mean can you talk a little bit about that about the tension between the three as one and the one <laughs> sounds like the three of us always tension um i think that uh that's a natural occurrence uh that that with our with the very process that the, just the way that we work, um, I think because uh, we're always responding to uh, what has gone on before us in when we come back to a drawing, and um, and everything will take off in different directions. So it's uh, is our process clear like. How do, should we, we rotate? I think we should describe that a little bit more clearly. Uh, so we have three of us, each of us working on one drawing, one piece. 
And if it's if they're larger scale like this, the, the drawings will be up on a wall or uh, in this sense on a board. And the, we have to rotate ourselves as artists. We can we'll we'll demonstrate. 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 <laughs> so we could be working for about 15 minutes to an hour and then somebody will make a decision to rotate. We'll say, shall we rotate? And then we do. And like we, would, we would Let's rotate between, between the drawings. We'll so, right. And usually we rotate clockwise. I would normally end up here. <laughs> That's like that. it's, it's, so, it so the rotation that happens. There's yeah. the rotation. So, uh, and that's important because. Um, and then we're all in front of a new drawing, and then we're and all we begin working. Drawing. Yeah. yeah, and no one is is suggesting what we should be doing next at all. Uh, the only time anybody speaks up about process uh, is when someone says, oh, "I think it's time to move, shift, and yeah. shift." But we certainly we're always not wanting to be too precious. But this this was a, a, a new game for us taking on this this project, the underground map, because you know there was so much to take in and, and try to respect and 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 accomplish a finished piece that uh, that held all of that information. Um, but at the same time, to, to be free and, and as, as, as possible, as we always are with Drunken Paw. Uh, a really good aspect that we need to mention is, is we made this for six months through COVID. And, and just like amazing, huge uh, walls in our way to, uh, to accomplish the final mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about the studio? Sure. Leslie, or... So... Uh... We were working in uh, my studio, which is at Art Point um, in Ramsey, and it's about maybe 350 to 375 square feet. So we were able to spread out nicely, but we all we had to uh, observe protocol at the studios and I had to sign Mark and Janet in so we could do contact tracing if necessary. And we had to wear masks in, in the space. Um, we were sterilizing our not sterilizing only our pens, our pens. <laughs> um, and and there was a period of time in that studio where we couldn't access because there was COVID present, mm. so we were locked out. Mm -hmm. And then another thing that happened. Yeah, and my uh, studio was also broken into yeah. while we were working on this project. Uh, all there were a number of studios broken into at the time, and all of my gear was stolen. Uh, so and my studio just completely. Uh, rifled through and and trashed and but they left the maps the <laughs> maps were were left the intact. drawings were left was... fully intact we were very lucky uh but there was so there was a lot of things we were facing while while making this happen which made it a, a, a particularly interesting uh project to so i hope through. that answered kind of some question there uh from you diana or from jim yeah what i mean are there other or Diana, did you, were you going to say something? I just have a yeah. comment. It's oh, that okay. as you, one of the things I really loved about, love about having us work together is that I think that your working process uh, in so many ways um, it is, is kind of a mirror of a lot of the working processes that the organizations and the projects we see on the map yeah. uh, use as well. So ideas of collaboration and consensus and freedom and kind of um, almost anarchy at times. <laughs> uh, you know, these things are these things are embedded in the culture of the organizations uh, and projects and artist practices that are represented on the map. So it's so I think that's why it was just such a nice fit. Um, and I think you can feel that in the in the final drawings. I think you can feel that in the imagery. Nice. Oh, yeah, I hope so. Good. That's wonderful. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really lovely. Um, here's the three uh, just on the boards after they were completed. Um, do we have anything else to say about the process? There are, the... There are some questions actually in the chat. Oh, that's um, great. Okay. Which I don't know if you guys are seeing or not. No, we're um, not. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Okay. So here's one. Uh, uh, I guess more towards Diana, I'm curious if your research turned up any truly dislocated alternative spaces. Was there anything you would have liked to include that you had not had to uh, not include by virtue of ambiguous or too varied geography? 
uh, was was there anything that was sort of dispersed or not not localized or spatialized? Um, yeah, dislocated uh, alternative spaces. Not sure how to interpret that quite, but um, you know, I think we absolutely, I absolutely put a geographic parameter around it in terms of the the city center, and I know that there are there are activities that have occurred and continue to occur outside um, outside of the the city uh, limits. So um, those those were probably did not get any attention uh, and should get some. Um, I'm actually particularly interested now in a lot of the activities that are happening in like rural areas that are very similar, um, uh, you know, like the residency in Creston that you guys, Drunken Paul, will be going to in April. So uh, Empire of Dirt. So that is probably one. And then, you know, I know that there's things that I didn't know about and I still don't know about. And uh, so, and I'd be interested in hearing about. So if there are people out there that do know things that aren't reflected on the map, I think that what this, what this does is it sort of starts a process of looking and um, understanding how complicated the ecology is. But I know there's things that um, I missed too. Uh, Sean Hunter has asked, is any idea when and where we will get to see these three maps in person? Uh, I am at, we, there will be an event at, uh, at the Esker uh, in uh, late April, uh, April the 22nd, and I'm hoping uh, we will be able to have the, have the, have the, have the drawings there. Um, but we're continuing to scheme. There was, of course, uh, as with the drawing process itself, uh, uh, the exhibition <laughs> has been kind of waylaid by COVID as well. Um, there's also, I mean, tons of love coming through in the chat. And, um, and that's one of the lovely things for me, actually, is seeing how these maps resonate with the communities um, that they're documenting. And uh, we saw that with the uh, Indigenous map and, and with the queer map, and now it seems uh, with the history map as well, um, the, the kind of emotional resonance that, uh, that comes from these drawings is quite lovely. Um, there was another comment as well about just uh, from Kira about the um, the layers, the layering upon layering upon layering, which mm -hmm. again is a nice way of reflecting the layered history, I think, mm -hmm. but in a spatial way. Jim, um, I have a, one one question, if I may, just about what in in all of the atlas projects with the art the uh, artwork that's made, what what's happening with the originals? Is that I know that varies from project to project, but you know that's it after a number of maps that becomes an interesting legacy all on its own absolutely i mean we would love to see a giant group exhibition <laughs> at the end of it um or at a certain point uh we would also love to gather them that was the original idea was to have a book um, and gather the things together but we realized that would take about a thousand years and nobody would ever get to see this stuff uh, mm -hmm. so we decided to put it into individual maps um, and we're hoping too that as with uh, a couple of these maps, the art will also have its own life <laughs> independent of the project. Um, but yeah, we're, def we're definitely interested in, in, uh, in trying to push, uh, to push the artwork and get as many people to see it as, as possibly can. I'm gonna jump in there and uh, just say that we have time for one last question and uh, it is a question from Dick who says, uh, question for Mark and perhaps the team, you mentioned the nature of the beast as part of the process in relation to the creatures and your artwork for the maps. Can you talk a little bit more about your choice of animals in context to specific venues, art events, et cetera, et cetera? Um, anyway, I'll, 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 uh, I'll turn it over to you, you Mark. Any thoughts? Hmm, yeah. Um... I think a lot of the beasts, et cetera, the imagery that it's it's more magic, realism. Uh, it just sort of plain, our playful way of, uh, of producing images between the three of us. Um, anybody want to jump in? Sometimes yeah. they kind of create themselves based upon all of the drawing that's happened beforehand. You might be looking at something and all of a sudden you see this other form that um, that you just begin to uh, 
carve out mm -hmm. in the drawing and allow that <clears throat> some space to uh, to be a presence. So it's very spontaneous. Often, often the creatures that you will see uh, arise in these drawings are the three of us have somehow created them together just by responding to each other. So it's never one person that is creating anything. Creating anything. Um, I think at the bottom of this particular drawing, you can see the white, a white buffalo there. Mm -hmm. uh, that buffalo, that creature is specifically uh, the logo for chaos. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that found its way onto mm -hmm. the map. And so there, there's a little bit of animal imagery there. There's a black cat that was mm -hmm. the night uh, gallery, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. There's, so those are, you know, there's a few coming from logos and other people's, uh, uh, you know, different organizations, uh, just imagery, but, um, but the very strange creatures are usually the, the are, are three. It's a uh, conjuring between. Yeah, it's a conjuring. Between, yeah. <laughs> That's a great word yeah. for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for that response and Dick for your question. It's just an amazing, amazing project and lots and lots of kudos and comments coming in. Thank you all who, who uh, took the time to type. I will share those comments with, with you just be, in case you need a pat on the back. Um, but thank you to Drunken Paw. Thank you, Diana. And thank you, Jim Ellis, for, uh, for sharing this amazing project with us.